Hey everyone and welcome. We're gonna get started in a few minutes. So we're going to see if we can run this somewhat interactively. So if you feel up to it, uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, and if not, that's perfectly fine too. So I'll do this introduction one more time, but I'm going to put a link in the chat, um, which is the RCDO Cloud project we're going to base things off of. Um, so if you would like to follow along with the code and write it yourself as well, you're welcome to go to that link and log in. Um, you should be able to use a Google or a GitHub login or create an account. Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Mina Chetinkara Rondel. I am a professor of the practice in the statistical science department at Duke University and an educator at our studio. And today we're gonna do a little bit of data visualization. Um, I should start by saying I'm not necessarily an expert at data visualization, but I really, really enjoy making them. Um, and the goal of today is to live code along with you and hopefully with your participation um, to create something. And I have a few highlights that I wanna touch on, but I'm also happy to be swayed by people's opinions should you choose to express them uh, in the chat. I am going to be coding in R using RStudio and I've set up an RStudio cloud project where I have a little bit of code to get us started. So if you would like to follow along with the code as well, uh, I'm going to put a link in the chat that should get you to an RStudio cloud window. Um, the first thing you're going to be asked to do is to log in. So when you can log in using a GitHub or a Google account or create an account yourself with our studio and log in that way. And uh, when you open it up, you are going to uh, land in an R studio session. And on top, you will see that it says temporary copy. And it asks you if you would like to save a permanent copy for yourself. I would recommend doing that so that you can own a copy of it for yourself. Um, if you have, um, 
questions. Um, let's see, Tiffany, are they able to uh, chat with us? There is a question in the Q&A. What do you think? Yes, let me double check the settings, but you guys should be able to chat with us. Yes. So if anybody is um, having difficulty with the chat, do let us know in the Q&A. And if not, we can just pivot to the Q&A. It's not a big deal. Maybe someone could try to type something in the chat. Okay, it does say um, chat disabled. So I'm going to share the uh, link one more time in the chat. At least you should be able to see that. And um, you are then, it seems like maybe the chat won't work, but that's fine. We can just use the Q&A. Is that good, Tiffany? That's great on my end. Yeah. It, it, okay. Sorry, guys. <laughs> no worries. No worries at all. We usually run these without the chat. So I was thinking, should we try something new? So I'm going to put this uh, link in the chat one more time. Um, and maybe Tiffany in a couple of minutes, if you wanted to paste that again in the chat, if more people come in, uh, that would be great. So um, if you have any questions, just use the Q&A box um, and I will try to watch that closely. So I am going to go ahead and start by sharing my screen. There we go. Um, and so what we're going to do today is to, uh, I'm going to actually pick a data set from Tidy Tuesday and do a visualization based off of that. So how about we start by um, actually introducing you to Tidy Tuesday in case uh, you are not familiar with it. So it's a community project. And every Monday, there is a new data set that's posted. And usually on Tuesday, people uh, share the data visualizations that they create based off of that. And the repo for Tidy Tuesday is, you can find it on GitHub at r 4 data science slash Tidy Tuesday. Um, and I am going to scroll down to this week's um, data set that was just released yesterday. Uh, it's called Big Pumpkins, and I was interested in that because I have a little one at home and we've already done some pumpkin carving. So I thought that was quite appropriate to work with. Um, so let's take a look at where the data comes from. So it comes from bigpumpkins.com. Um, and we basically um, have information on sizes of really, really big pumpkins. Um, and we can load the data directly from the GitHub repository. So that's the approach that I'm going to use. And if we quickly take a look at the data dictionary, we can see that we know some things about the year and uh, type of the pumpkin. So the year in which the measurement was taken and then the various types are things like a field pumpkin, a giant pumpkin, giant squash, giant watermelon, long gourd and tomato. So uh, we won't use all of those. And we also know um, kind of the ranking of the pumpkin for that year and then the weight of it, which is what we're going to mostly be working with. Um, so let's go ahead and load our data set and get started. I am going to be using the Tidyverse uh, package or the Tidyverse suite of packages for doing my analysis. So I'm going to go ahead and load that. And my next move is going to be to read the data set, the pumpkins data set that's comprised of 28,000 observations. And we can take a look at that and we can basically see those same variables that we were seeing um, in the uh, data dictionary here as well. So. What do we do when we first get a data set like this? Um, my first move generally is to start doing a little bit of exploration. So I probably would take a look at some of the variables and take a look at their uh, distributions. For example, we have IDs that seems to be comprised of a year. And as we said, a type, that's an identifier for the type of uh, vegetable that we are working with. So let's go ahead and start with our pumpkins data set and see what are the various types of uh, ID, vari uh, ID values we have. So for that, I'm going to use the distinct function. Um, and we can see that we have, um, oh, lots and lots of options here. So perhaps it would be better to pop this out to the data viewer by uh, piping that into the view function maybe we can take a look at this here. Our data starts in 2013 and goes all the way to 2021. And we can see that we have information on the various um, uh, 
uh, pumpkins here. Now we have two pieces of information in this one variable. So we're going to go ahead and separate those into two separate columns so that we are able to handle the year and the uh, type of pumpkin separately. Um, so now that I have a sense of what this data set looks like, um, the first thing that I want to do is separate that um, separate that ID variable into um, into two variables. One of them is the year, and let's call the other one is type. Okay. So that gives me a data frame uh, where I have the year and type separated into two um, variables so I can actually handle them differently. One thing I'm recognizing here is that year is a character variable, but we're probably going to want to use that as a numeric variable. So another thing I might want to do while I'm at it is to say that um, year should be, I'm going to use some function to turn it into numeric. One of the functions I like to use for doing that, this is the parse number function from the read R package, which will take a look at a set of values or character strings and grab the numbers from out of it. And it's nice when it fails, it gives you nice messages about where it fails as well. Um, but it looks like it didn't fail anywhere. All of these were able to be able to convert it to numeric values pretty easily. So now I have my year and type information I can work with. Um, and the other variable that we said we're going to uh, take a look at is weight, right? And that also seems to be a um, character variable, even though we clearly have numbers here. So let's take a look to see what might be going on there. Um, one way that we might, again, one way that I like attacking a problem like this is saying, okay, let's take a look at all the distinct values of weight to see if we can see what might be going on. A lot of these look like numbers. Um, it's not giving me anything on the higher end. Maybe I'll scroll all the way to the bottom. And what I can see is that there are some um, values here that are um, that are text entries. And that's probably why this column uh, appears as uh, character variables, but I will need them to be numbers in order to be able to plot the weights. So we're gonna have to do something about that. Now, I don't just want to say parse that number out for me because I can see that there are actually valid numbers in there, but none of those numbers are necessarily uh, weights of pumpkins. So I probably want to get rid of um, those observations. So if I, if we look to see, you know, there are some uh, pumpkins that seem to be called exhibition only. So maybe another way of taking a look at it would be to say, filter my data set such that um, wherever you detect the exhibition only text string um, in the data. So let's take a look to see what this gives us. And we can see that in fact, for both weight and place variables, we have a bunch of observations uh, where the format is of this form, so many entries, and then in parentheses, we have something and exhibition only. We know that none of these are real weights or none of them are real places. So I am going to omit these data from my analysis. Um, so let's go ahead and say anything that contains exhibition only, we want to filter out. So you can see one of the things I'm doing here is I have an area where I'm using to explore my data, just quickly interactively do so. And then a different area where I'm actually taking note of my various uh, data wrangling steps so that I can then save that wrangled data or tidy data um, for my analysis. So um, another step we said we're going to do is we're going to filter our data set for wherever um, we don't detect the exhibition only uh, character string and the weight variable. So if we take a look at this uh, and let's go ahead and pipe this into uh, view again so that we can take a look. Um, 
I wonder if we've been able to um, actually get rid of all of the offending rows in our weight and place variables. Um, it seems like maybe in weight, but I am quickly catching here another character string, EXH, which probably also stands for exhibition. So let's go ahead and while we're at it, filter those out as well. So um, I'm going to filter out wherever uh, weight has the character string exhibition only, and also wherever place is not equal to EXH. So you can see I'm using the data viewer to roughly take a look to see if I can identify any kind of offending um, uh, observations. And here is one more. Uh, we also have something that maybe stands for damaged would be my guess, DMG. Let's go ahead and get rid of those as well. So I don't want weight to be equal to EXH and I don't want it to be equal to DMG. So in order to do that, I can use the in operator. Um, and let's take a look at our data one more time. Once again, I'm using the kind of the sorting functionality in the viewer to quickly look to see if I have kind of uh, done what needs to happen to get rid of any of the offending rows. I don't know if I've gotten rid of all of them, to be honest, but this is a good place to go back and check for things again. So I believe at this point, I have numerical data for place and I have numerical data for weight. However, I know that those uh, values are still coded as characters. So let's take a look here. They are still coded as characters. So now I'm going to be brave and say, let's try to parse these into numbers as well. Um, I have a mutate step and a filter step in my pipeline. I could probably move these around, filter first, and uh, mutate a bunch of variables at once. So I want to mutate my year. I want to mutate my place. Again, with parse number. And I want to mutate my weight again with parse number. Are there any questions about any of the functions that I'm using, please do put them in the chat and we can take a look. So um, let's take a look to see what this gives me. Do I get any errors? It looks like I did not get any warnings or errors from this step. So if there was indeed still uh, text strings in either place or weight that could not be parsable, um, uh, then we would actually get um, a, a warning here uh, saying that those have been converted to NAs. Um, um, and so in this case, um, we didn't, so we kind of feel confident that we caught all those. Um, we caught all of those um, text strings. So one question that came in is, um, uh, what package is str detect in? So that's in the string r package. I can actually note that here, so you can see that written as well, which comes with the tidyverse. So that's why I didn't load that. Um, that's why I didn't load that um, separately. And then the other question is, is parse number like as numeric? And parse number is like as numeric in a way, as in we are converting that uh, cell to a number. However, um, if you are using as numeric and you have a, um, a character string in, your, in that particular entry, you're going to simply get an NA versus parse number is a bit smarter than that. Um, where it will take care of things like uh, decimal comma, for example, a thousand comma for you. So it, it does do the conversion, but it actually drops any non-numeric characters uh, before or after the first number. And it also um, um, ignores like grouping marks. So that would be something like a decimal um, comma as well, which as numeric wouldn't do for you. And that is in the readar package. Okay, so we have our data set that 
we have our year, we have the types of um, uh, fruits that are pumpkins. So types of pumpkins that we're working with, the place and weight as numeric variables. So I feel like we're ready to start um, we're ready to start um, visualizing um, um, the data. So before I do so, I had a request in the chat to share the code or in the um, Q&A box to share the code. I don't know if you can actually copy paste things from the chat, but I am going to paste all of this in here just in case. So that's the code that we have uh, so far. Okay. Um, what I am going to do is I am going to name this data set that I have started with pumpkins to plot. So I don't want to write over my pumpkins data set so that I can actually work with this slightly smaller pumpkins to plot data set uh, for my plotting. What are some things that we might look at? We can start with a really simple um, visualization uh, where we simply make, let's say, a histogram of the weights weight LBS, and let's say we want to ge do a geom histogram, okay? So the weights of pumpkins are right skewed, and um, we have weights all the way up to 2,000 points, which just uh, sounds crazy. Um, another question I got is, will I share the code after? Yeah, I will share the code after. I'll uh, put this on GitHub and share a link with you. So, so if you just want to sit back and watch, that's perfectly fine as well. So we know that our uh, pumpkins have uh, varying uh, weights. Um, let's maybe do something like color by type, or maybe we would want to fill by type. Um, so we can see the various types. And if we go back to our, um, if we go back to our uh, data dictionary, we know that we have things like field pumpkins, giant pumpkins, giant squash, watermelon, longboard, which actually is not weight, but length. Uh, so that's a different, um, that's a different um, uh, measurement, which we wouldn't want to plot together, and then tomatoes. So what I would like to do is I would like to limit my analysis to things that are more like pumpkins <laughs> and um, that are actually weight. So we are going to eliminate any of the types that are W, L, or T. So let's go ahead and go back to our wrangling step and say that we want um, type to be, um, well, I guess we can do it inclusively. So we want type in, so that is F, P, or S. Um, so I am going to redo my, um, recreate my data set that's even smaller now, and then make my plot again. So these are the three um, types of pumpkins that we're going to be working with. Uh, one more question before we continue. Um, I was asked if, we can share the code without having to log in or create an account. Yes, at the end, I will post this as a gist on GitHub as a public gist so you won't have to create an account. The creating an account is only if you want to use our Studio Cloud and the packages I have installed. It's not a must at all for participation. Um, okay, so. This is a visualization, but not a very uh, exciting one. Um, so let's try a few other things. We have the year information for our, um, for our data. So how about we said that I would like to put year on our x-axis and maybe um, color by type. And let's put our, uh, on our y-axis, let's put our weight. And I will make box plots instead. So we have uh, year, weight, and color. But I would like my year to be uh, considered as a factor. So I have it as a categorical variable. So we can basically see that F, which are field pumpkins, are generally smaller. And then P, which are giant pumpkins, are slightly bigger and then 
sorry, those are the biggest. And then the blues are S's, which are uh, giant squashes, which are a little bit um, uh, somewhere in between. So I find this having to look back and forth between the, um, I find this like um, back and forth between the code book and the visualization to be super irritating, to be honest. So let's go ahead and do something about that. How about we actually um, recode our type variable so that we actually put the words that we need to refer to them. So in order to do this, I basically have three uh, conditions that I want to uh, capture. So I will use a case when statement and say, if type is equal to, um, to do F, it is going to be field pumpkin. If, right, field pumpkin, giant pumpkin, and giant squash. If it is equal to P, it is giant pumpkin. And if it's equal to S, it is giant squash. Okay, that looks a little bit better. So another question is, it looks like there are some zero weight pumpkins. Is this correct or just a bin artifact? Good question. I have no idea. So let's take a look. Uh, let's see, do we actually have pumpkins that are um, zero and where the weights are zero? So we can say filter weight is equal to zero. It looks like there are no pumpkins where the weight is actually equal to zero. So it just looks like a bin artifact. Uh, I guess that was a question referring to the histogram. Okay, so we have this visualization here. We can say something roughly about the weights of the pumpkins, um, but it looks like um, we may wanna make this a little bit nicer, right? So what are some things that we might do to uh, start making this a little bit nicer? I am going to try representing these uh, with uh, points as opposed to box plots. And let's in fact add a jitter to our points so that they're not all on top of each other. So we can see that there's a lot of uh, pumpkins that are being overplotted, right? So we are plotting at this point 18,000 pumpkins um, and probably not all of them are all that interesting. So how about we do uh, one more filter and say that we are going to um, only plot like kind of top placing pumpkins. So that are less than or equal to 100 in terms of, um, so they're ranking at whatever competition they were being measured at. So I'm going to change my data set. We can see that that's a much smaller data set now, 2704. And if we plot these, we can see a nice separation between the field pumpkins, giant pumpkins, and the giant squashes. So I'd like to take a moment at this point to ask you all, what are some things that we could do to spruce up this plot? So if anyone has any ideas, do pop them in the Q&A um, box, and then we'll take it from there. I'll give you a minute to think about it. Or also, if you have any questions, this is a good time to ask as well. Better y-axis points, okay. Uh, so we had some um, suggestions. We have better y-axis points. Um, maybe axis labels could be more readable. Um, colors could match the fruit or the vegetable. I like that. Uh, perhaps it would be better to show the pumpkin time separately. Maybe the dots are too overlapping. Uh, maybe something like regression lines. So. Let's kind of run with some of these ideas. Let's start with that um, color idea, okay? So what we might want to do is, so I don't know off the top of my know the colors of these. So I am just going to uh, look for something like Halloween color palette, okay? Um, here is one option that we came across to see. Um, maybe might we find something here? 
Um, let me look to see. I think this was another one that I came across earlier today. So this looks like a nice color uh, palette to me that we might work off of, okay? It looks like the metal orange color uh, could be like the field pumpkin. Uh, maybe the beige color could be the, um, could be the squash and then somewhere in between could be the other pumpkin. So let's go ahead and try to grab these colors. Um, a tool that you can use if you're on a Mac is that the digital color meter. Um, so let's go ahead and grab the colors for these. So we have, um, so I'm going to grab the hex colors for these. So I'm going to note them quickly. P56A49. Uh, one second. Okay. Um, so what did we say? So we have E56A49. So I'm going to take note of these. E56A49, I think. Um, and if you all don't mind, I am going to cheat just a little bit here because um, it is hard to keep all of this in mind. Okay, E9BC83. And then finally, let's say we will use, um, CD7F4F. Okay, so these are the three colors that I am going to use for these pumpkins. Um, how can I do this? So in uh, ggplot, I can do uh, scale. Uh, this is the color aesthetic, so scale color manual. And I can say my values are equal to, and I can basically grab these three um, hex codes that I have and feed them as color, um, as character strings. So let's go ahead and do this. I have not yet paid attention to the, um, the orders, but this is what they start looking like, okay? So it looks like we haven't actually, uh, we may or may not have matched the colors nicely to the um, various levels we have. For example, over here, I probably wanted the squash to be the beige. I could play a guessing game, but that can get frustrating. So in ggplot2, you can also um, give named vectors for your, um, for your um, various levels. So we are going to actually, note um, which uh, levels these correspond to. So let's maybe do something like this. And what we need to make sure is that the names that we type here match exactly the names that we're seeing um, in the um, data. So we have field pumpkin, giant pumpkin, and um, giant squash. So now that I can see the colors, it's a bit easier for me to see which ones I might want to swap with each other. So let's go ahead and swap these two. So we have the field pumpkins, giant pumpkins, and giant squashes. Now we have selected some colors that look orange. Um, and if you, um, you know, for some of us, these three colors might be distinguishable. And for some of us, they may not be. So a tool that I like to use is a simulator tool for um, uh, kind of, um, you know, visual differences. And the particular tool I use is called Sim Daltonism, which is an open source tool that is available um, freely, but you might use other tools as well. And you can see when I pop this up, it creates this kind of overlay on my screen. And on this overlay, I am able to see what the colors would look like under various um, um, kind of uh, visual differences. So red-green confusion, so various types of red-green confusion, we can see those two 
oranges actually look uh, very similar to each other for certain vision types, and that's probably not a good idea. So we've grabbed some color palettes, but maybe we're not super happy with that. Um, so the name of the tool is called Sim Daltonism. I put that on the um, chat as well, just so you can look for it if you like. So I am going to go ahead and pick a different color uh, for my, um, sorry, let's do the giant pumpkin stack color. Okay. Oh man, I said the giant pumpkins and I did not do that. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, so now we have a slightly different color. And if we look at this under the kind of the simulator, um, it actually looks nice. Purple is another Halloween color. So maybe we could do better potentially, but at least we are able to pick some colors that are distinguishable from each other. And depending on your aesthetic, uh, this might be a good um, aesthetic or not. So I'm going to play around with colors a little bit more. But before we do so, at this point, we have used color to represent differences between types. And generally, it's a good idea to use some sort of double encoding for doing this, uh, because even with these, the simulator tool that I have used, you know, it is not 100% clear that anyone looking at this will be able to see those differences. Um, if you're going to print things out, they might look even different. So color behaves differently in different mediums for different people. So we might also want to do um, shape, uh, shapes based on the um, type of um, uh, pumpkin we have as well. So in addition to uh, color being mapped to type, let's also map shape to type as well. So now I have various shapes, uh, so triangles, squares, and circles by default. I am going to be a little bit picky and um, add a layer for manually defining my uh, shapes as well. So I can probably just copy this and say, I want my giant pumpkins to be circles. I want my giant squashes to be diamonds and I want my field pumpkins to be squares, for example. So now they look something like this. Um, there's a lot of overplotting happening here. So maybe we wanna take that alpha level down a little bit for all of these. Um, so we can see the differences and the overplotting a little bit better. And finally, something that we might want to do is actually change the sizes of the plotting um, shapes uh, based on the various uh, types as well. So I am going to go ahead and map uh, size to type as well. And let's see what happens by default. So those just look huge, okay? <laughs> that does not look good at all, but we can once again um, use uh, kind of manually define what sizes we want as well. So maybe we want our giant pumpkins to be the biggest and then the squashes to be the second and then the field pumpkins to be the first but since those are the smallest. So maybe things look something like this, uh, which looks perhaps a little bit better uh, than what we started with. So a few other things that we might want to do is this default gray background, which is very characteristically ggplot2, is something I'm personally not a huge fan of. Uh, so I'm going to change the theme to, to the theme minimal, which looks a little bit cleaner. Um, and then um, since it's Halloween, let's go ahead and make things a bit darker. So I am going to actually manipulate the theme elements in ggplot2 now to uh, change the background of the plot. Uh, to a different color. So the color that I'm going to use is a dark gray color. So I'm going to go ahead and cheat and bring in that hex color. But the way we define these various um, uh, theme elements is actually not by just giving it a color, but since we can define, you know, the color of the background or the size or the borders, and we need to be able to feed these separately, each of these goes into a separate element where I can then say the fill color of the element rectangle is this dark gray. 
So now I have something like this that I can work with. That's looking a bit more Halloween-ish. The text is impossible to read. So how about we go ahead and say that uh, the color of the text should just be white or something. Okay. Um, another thing that is looking um, not so great are these white uh, lines that correspond to the um, various um, kind of the grid lines. So maybe we may want to get rid of some of those grid lines. So panel grid major X. And if you want to get rid of them, you can use the element blank uh, function. So we got rid of the vertical lines. I'd like to also get rid of the some of the horizontal lines as well, but maybe not the major ones, but the minor ones. So now we got rid of oh, we need a comma here. And those um, lines that we're seeing at the 1000 and 2000, they are just um, quite thick for, uh, you know, and really get in the way. So we might just simply change the type of them. So I might make them very thin and I might change their line type to be dotted. Okay, now I am getting a, oh, here we go. It's saying that this was matched by multiple actual arguments. So it's really the major lines that I wanted to change. Uh, we have a suggestion in the Q&A box. That's a great suggestion, which is that the legend is not matching our, uh, the order in the legend is not matching things. And that's really, really a good observation. So let's go ahead and fix that. Um, and in fact, let's do a bit better. You know, instead of having a legend, maybe we can use actual uh, annotation um, on our uh, plots. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine this suggestion with a suggestion that was made earlier, which was about regression lines. So instead of fitting a model and adding regression lines, how about we try to find out for each year what the median um, uh, pumpkin size is. And I'm saying median instead of mean, because we originally observed that these were right skewed distributions. Um, and then we can overlay um, a line that connects those medians together and then use that as our guide to uh, do um, our um, uh, annotation as well. So in order to be able to overlay another, uh, basically another data set in this case, right? Now I don't want my raw data, but I just want my medians. I need to first calculate them. So I have my uh, pumpkins to plot data set that I can use to start calculating those medians. What I want to do is group by uh, first year and then the type of pumpkin. And then we want to summarize maybe median weight LBS to be median of the weight LBS variable. Let's go ahead and see if this gives us what we want. So in fact, for each year and each pumpkin type, we get a median. Um, and we also get this uh, kind of message here that tells us that our data is still grouped by year. So if that's not something we want, we can overwrite it. So let's go ahead and do that. So I, want it, I don't want my data to be grouped anymore after this step. So I'm going to go ahead and overwrite that and that gets rid of that message. And let's go ahead and save this new data frame we created as medians to plot, okay? So that just has 27 observations and we can overlay that. Um, I'm going to first put this at the very bottom and say that I want to create a line with this new data set where on the x-axis I have year and on the y-axis I have the median weight LBS. That did not work. Um, so let's see what the issue is. 
median weight LDS. I think this should be a factor since we have that as a factor to begin with. There we go. And now it says each group consists of only one observation. Do you need to adjust the group aesthetic? So how do we want to group our lines? We want to group based on the type of pumpkin. So we can now see the size of those lines, uh, those lines appearing, although they are incredibly difficult to see. So how about we change their size to be something uh, constant? So now you can see those lines a little bit better, um, kind of in the foreground. Uh, this, if this is the sort of thing you would want to put in the background of the points as opposed to the foreground, we could actually go ahead and change where it appears on our layer. So maybe it's better for it to come before we add the points. Okay. Now, every time I run this code, something is happening. The plot is changing a little bit. The reason is that we're jittering our points to avoid, to help with overplotting a little bit, but we're doing it in a way where um, we haven't set a particular seed, so they change each time. So while you're interactively developing this, it's not that big a deal, but ultimately this is the sort of thing you would probably want to change. Now, the what, kind of sent us down this path was this annoying uh, legend. And we said, let's use annotation to do that so that we can actually annotate it right next to where the various batches of points appear as opposed to adding a legend. So the first thing I'm going to do is to take away the legend. Um, one of the things that's giving me a legend is the points. So how about we say, turn off the legend for that. And the other thing that's giving us a legend is the lines. So we're going to use the show legend argument to take off the legend for that as well. So now our legends are gone, but obviously we want to bring them back. So what we might want to do is we might want to add a new level, a new layer to our data set. And the data will come from the um, medians to plot data set. But I don't necessarily want that entire data set. Actually, I would like to annotate at the very end. So that's for, um, I would like to annotate them at the levels where the 2021 values are visible. So how about we filter this data set for where year um, is equal to 2021. And I wonder if in fact, we might want to, um, Let's go ahead and figure out what this data set should look like. Instead of doing so much calculation in our um, plot. So these are basically the values where I want to plot at the very end. And I have the Y axis coordinates and the median weight LBS as well. Um, so let's say these are the maxes to plot. This is the data set that I want to plot. Um, for my aesthetic mappings, the X could be year and Y could be the median weight LBS. Oh, and it asks me, well, what do you want to say in there? So the label is going to be the type. So what do we have here? Um, our uh, data site got completely squished, but you can kind of see that actually the text is there. One of the things that's happening is that we're regaining a um, uh, legend that we should turn off, turn off. So let's do show legend equals false. And then let's deal with the, um, with whatever is happening here in terms of, yeah, I probably need a uh, factor year again. So let's go ahead and do that. So now I can kind of see that text underneath, but it's not showing very well. So how about we maybe uh, shift them over a little bit? 
but now they're out of our plot. So we're going to have to do something about the plotting area that we have so that we can regain some space for those, um, for those annotation marks, okay? So a trick that I like at this point is I am trying to place some text around and it's really hard to see where that text even goes. So something that you might want to do is make them very obvious. So I made their color red and their size 10 so I can kind of see where they are, okay? Um, obviously this is not how we're going to want things but I'm going to work with that to try to move them to where I want them to be. And then afterwards I can take their sizes back to something reasonable. So one of the things I want to do for myself is to give myself a little bit of um, margins around my plot. So this takes a uh, unit arguments uh, and that has four um, elements in it. So top, right, bottom, and left spells trouble. Um, and so let's do one. And then let's say these are going to be centimeters or something to start with. So now I've given myself a centimeter around my entire plot. I probably don't need so much all around, but I know that on my right side, maybe I need a little bit more space. So what if we do two, for example? Um, Let's make the size of this text something a bit more reasonable now so that we can actually see um, what we need it to be to fit, okay? And another thing that I might want to do is I might want to um, left align them so that they're aligned on the left. Um, and what's happening is that my plot is like basically the, the text is being clipped off. So I need to, um, uh, the text is being clipped and I need to uh, not allow ggplot2 to clip the geoms that are falling outside of the plotting range. And that is something that I can take care of in the chord Cartesian layer. Um, the clip is on by default and we want to turn that off. So now I can see uh, my text. Something that I'm going to do is I have lots of vertical space to work with and those the uh, text is quite long. So how about in this uh, label, we actually uh, say that we are going to replace the space with a line break, which is a backslash N. So I can gain a little bit of space with that. And let's shift them over a little bit. What did I do? Let's shift them over a little bit. Um, so it says that I can't actually do this, that I can't add uh, one to a factor. Um, so what we maybe need to do is to, hmm. what if I said 2022? Would you understand that? No. So I, it looks like my x-axis is being persnickety that I need to be able to work with, if I was able to work with numerical values, uh, this would work. So let's go back and see how, what we might be able to do in order to be able to work with numerical values on my x-axis um, so that going forward, I don't need to um, run into this problem. So I'm going to go back and see wherever I have made my year factor, if I can actually turn those into uh, numbers. So that is looking okay, except the labels are not where we would want them to be, but we can control that, right? So we can say that we want to match the scale uh, we want to create particular breaks for our um, uh, x-axis, and that could be the integers between 2013 and 2021. And those lines are probably my minor lines, so we can turn off all of the grids for the x-axis. 
average x is not defined in the element hierarchy. Okay, that is fine. Then we'll do that in two steps. There we go. So now we have turned them off. Those labels are still impossible to see. So how about we go ahead and make those white as well. So those are the axis labels or axis title. Axis title X or axis text. You can see that it's a little bit of, uh, all right, there we go. So we can now see our uh, text for the Y axis. And we should be able to do the same for, sorry, for the X axis. And we can now do the same for the Y axis as well. So we're kind of nearing the end of our time, um, but let's go ahead and um, at least fix a few things here. Um, so we have basically changed our, um, oh my God. Sorry about that. We have changed our uh, kind of the color of the text that we're working with. What would be a few other things that we might want to do in the next few minutes we have before we wrap things up? If you have any ideas, I'll give you um, a minute to think about that. I'll pop that in the chat. So we may want to uh, add a title for the plot. That's very good. Um, so let's go ahead and add a title for the plot. So in fact, let's go ahead and add a few things. So we can add a title and we can add a um, subtitle and we can add a um, uh, caption as well uh, in terms of where we have gotten our data. Um, uh, we may want to rename the axis labels. That's really good. So let's go ahead and do that. And I'll show you quickly um, a way of doing the um, um, kind of, so we obviously can do something like this, right? X could be year and Y could be um, weight, and then maybe in parentheses, LBS, something like this. So this is better, uh, but maybe we can do a little bit better. So let's go ahead and fix up the uh, margins of this plot to begin with. I'm going to pick slightly different levels for the margins. Um, and then we are going to, um, uh, first of all, play around with the Y axis. This, um, a little bit. So I will say scale y continuous. Um, the labels uh, can be um, a little bit more legible using the label number function from the scales package. So let's go ahead and do that. Load that up. So what this will get us is it will actually get us um, that little like space at the thousand separator. And something that we might want to do is add a suffix as well and actually add the pounds here. Oh, this should go inside the label number, sorry. And that seems to be taking up a lot of space. So how about we make use of some of that vertical space and place it this way, okay? Um, this will allow us to um, I lost my uh, this will allow us to maybe get rid of the uh, units here and maybe make things a little bit more uh, legible. A few other things that you might try to do is actually completely get rid of the labels here. So how about uh, we actually, remove them uh, from the X and Y axes and use annotation to place them elsewhere, maybe somewhere where we don't commonly see them. So something that I might do is um, place these um, underneath, um, 
place them underneath the, um, the axis uh, label. So I, I'll need to move them down a little bit. Um, so the Y value for this maybe needs to be a little bit less. Um, maybe we can play around with the coordinate uh, limits a little bit. Let me change the limits that we're working with and place them here. So this is, uh, and if we zoom out, this will look a little bit better. So maybe something like this, where you're placing them in a slightly different place than where you tend to uh, see them, which you can uh, achieve using annotation as well. So uh, one last thing that I will show you uh, before we wrap things up is how do you add a completely different element to your plot, something like an image. So one of the things I uh, brought in here that we have is a, um, a sign from Charlie Brown that says, welcome, great pumpkin. And that is stored as a PNG file in our, um, in our workspace. So I am going to use the magic package, which is uh, super helpful for uh, working with kind of image files in R. Uh, it's built on the image magic library. And we can actually use this to add an image to our plot. So in order to be able to do that, um, what we're going to want to do first is to read the image. Um, so that's the original image. And then I am going to resize it a little bit. So you can see in my environment that these are basically some external pointers that this is creating. So I am making my image a little bit smaller. Then I'm going to go ahead and plot my figure. Um, so here I'm basically using the graphic device in R to plot my figure and save it as an object. Um, all right, let's go ahead and save this plot as an object first. And then finally, I can say that I am going to um, take this figure and then create a composite image. And if we pop this out so we can see, we've actually kind of like denoted the maximum, uh, uh, the, the pumpkin with the highest um, uh, weight as the great pumpkin. So this is just a way of overlaying an image on an existing image. So what we had to do was to turn the image that we're building um, into a PNG that can be saved and then overlay on top of that. So a few other things that you may want to do. Um, so this is, we've basically gone through everything almost that I wanted to get to is as you uh, kind of build a plot like this, you may wanna go ahead and think about maybe different fonts that you may want to use. Uh, so one of my favorite fonts is a font called um, Atkinson Hyper Legible or Hyper Visible, sorry. That is kind of pretty easy to um, read um, and has good accessibility considerations as well. So maybe things look something like this as, um, a, as a kind of final result of your plot. So I will wrap things up here and see if, um, um, if people have any questions. And while I'm taking a look at the questions, what I'm going to do is I will go ahead and um, go to GitHub and create a public gist uh, where I can uh, place this code and uh, share the link of the uh, gist with you. If you um, go to the chat, let's go ahead and do that. You should be able to um, get to the uh, link. So if you are interested in making further adjustments to this visualization, um, you are welcome to grab the code that we developed together and then uh, work with it. And you can continue to do so in the RStudio Cloud project that we have built or you can simply install the packages and um, run things locally yourself as well. Let me see if there are any other um, questions. So one of the questions that came is, how do you decide the size of the final PNG and 
preserve good point size with the image? That's a really good question for which I don't have a really good answer. My answer is trial and error, keeping in mind what the ultimate venue for that graph is. So think about whether is it gonna be printer? Is it gonna be on screen? Is it gonna be on a projector? Is it gonna be shared on Twitter? And decide accordingly, but then it's really trial and error after that. All right. Um, there are a couple of questions that um, that were more um, kind of suggestions in terms of um, improving the visualization. So I will leave that up to you if you would like to take the code we developed and uh, continue working with that. And thanks so much for joining us today. I will share the final image we created on Twitter shortly as well. <laughs>